Okay. Ah, uh, there we go. Are we recording, Mike? Yes, take it away. All right, hey everybody, this is Harvey Sluggo Wasserman. This is the 106th Grassroots Emergency Election Protection Coalition Zoom call. Uh, we've got uh, 59 people with us to start, and uh, we have a huge uh, agenda on election protection and environmental preservation. Uh, as we always do, we're gonna start on the election protection side, and then we're gonna do another deep dive into nuclear power, renewable energy, global warming, uh, all the stuff that comes with um, uh, the fight over energy in this country. I'm talking to you from California where we have a so-called progressive governor, Gavin Newsom, who will be running for president, who is simultaneously promoting nuclear power and opposing solar energy. It's quite astounding. Uh, and so we will get to that um, in a little while. We are expecting Brendan Tannehill to join us. We're gonna be talking about uh, this uh, current, uh, this is a huge week in American politics. We're gonna talk about the raid on um, uh, uh, the, Trump's Mar-a-Lago. I don't know what else to call it. They don't wanna call it a raid, but um, seems like it was a raid. Uh, and and what, what we can expect with these documents and what the uh, right wing response will be. I have sent to Steve Caruso, there's a major article in the New York Times today about the rise of serious, serious fascism in Arizona. And this piece is really worth reading. Uh, if you don't have a uh, subscription to the New York Times, I, uh, I have sent the actual article to Steve Caruso. Um, Steve, I, I, maybe you can post it at freepress.org with Pete Johnson, but it's really worth looking at. We'll talk about that. Uh, we're gonna talk about Ohio and chaos. We're joined by Zuri Pope, uh, who had a, a, a young man who had an article and he's with us. I can see, hi Zuri, um, who uh, about uh, the chaos, fascist chaos in Ohio um, and uh, um, uh, the electoral chaos there. We're then gonna go to uh, veterans issues if Suzanne Gordon joins us. I don't know if she's with us. Uh, but we'll see. And then once we get through all the electoral stuff, we're gonna be joined by the great Kevin Camps. Uh, he and Maya Reeson and others are gonna tell us what's going on with nuclear power. The news from Ukraine keeps getting more and more terrifying. Um, uh, it seems more and more likely that one of these six reactors at Zaporozhye is gonna somehow uh, blow up. I mean, they're, they're, the, they're the first nuclear power plants um, in a war zone and everybody over there is very well aware of uh, how serious a catastrophe could be caused. I mean, one errant shell from either the Ukrainians or the Russians could cause uh, an accident or an event way worse than Chernobyl that would permanently irradiate all of Europe. And that could be happening as we speak, uh, having nothing to do with the usual issues on nuclear power. And then, you know, um, uh, Milo and I sat through hours of a hearing in um, um, California on continuing operations at Diablo Canyon. And it was barely mentioned that the <laughs> we have six atomic reactors in a war zone on the brink of being blown up. I mean, come on people, what are you thinking about? So Kevin Camps will join us from Beyond Nuclear and of course, uh, Tatanka Bricker is with us and Myla to talk about California. Uh, we do wanna mention the uh, grassroots tutorial video and that uh, Steve Caruso has cut for us and uh, the grassroots organizing list uh, that Wendy Lederman is putting together. So let's start with that so that everybody's on the same page with that. We have 66 people. Uh, Steve Caruso, can you uh, put the link to the video? And um, we have Ray McClendon with us, uh, maybe say a couple words. Last week, as many of you recall, we had um, uh, Andrew Miller, Ray McClendon, Joel Siegel, Robert Wilson, who's also with us, uh, talking about the realities of grassroots organizing. And the um, upshot is that we took about, I don't know, it was a 30, 40 minute uh, segment and turned it into a standalone video. 
that we now want to circulate to all grassroots groups uh, that we can. Uh, Steve, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the video? And then Wendy, you'll tell us about the, the list that you're compiling, because we want everybody to contribute to this grassroots list. We want to be able to reach as many grassroots organizing entities as we can in the United States. So first, uh, Ray, uh, Ray McClendon, uh, you saw the video, your major star in the video. Uh, can, if you can tell us a bit about it, and then Ray, Steve Caruso will give us the details about how we can spread it around. That would be really great. Ray McClendon, you with us here, Ray? I thought I saw you join. Or right, maybe you're in and out. Steve, can you tell us about this video and how people can get it and how they can circulate it? I uh, just unmuted Ray. Ray, are you able to? Yeah, yeah, my, yeah I'm yeah, here. Thanks. I was okay, trying. There I, you go. Yeah, I was trying to unmute. Yeah, uh, thanks, Harvey, Steve, Mike, for, for uh, pulling together last week the opportunity for us to create a, a video on what we know emphatically works on the ground. Uh, the relational organizing tactics that um, helped to deliver Georgia in 2020 and the uh, Senate runoffs in, in January of 2021. Uh, we are upping the ante in 2022, and hopefully this video will be a good guide post for uh, pulling together a, a variety of grassroots groups uh, that have similar goals and objectives and we can begin to put together a machine across the battleground states in order to begin to be much more effective and not have to rely on uh, any party to, to uh, get the vote out and let our voices be heard. So I'm grateful for what you've done. And I think it's a great start, especially for this upcoming uh, 2022 election season. Well, Ray, you're working uh, with, with Andrea in 2021 in Georgia, made the world of difference. Uh, you know, we can't even begin to talk about how much impact that has had as living proof that activism can make a difference, does make a difference, has made a difference, and uh, that uh, it was done with, you know, on a shoestring. And, um, you know, uh, we now know exactly what we need to do in 22. Uh, an election that's what two three months away uh, to save um, our country. Steve Caruso, do you want to talk about the uh, mechanics of how people can take this uh, link and send it around? Yes. So you can embed it. I've got uh, the two links there. Take some text from the website and then embed these links into the text and put it on your website, or just take the links and share them out. Um, I won't talk about the video that much. Uh, they go into nuts and balls, Andrea and, and Ray, more so Andrea with a slideshow, so forth and so on. And I'll add to the website link. There are two there right now in chat, the video and the website link for with more inf definite information on how you can organize these groups around the country. F fantastic. So everybody, it's in the chat. The link is in the chat. We, we are desperately encouraging you to send it to everybody that you know uh, that's doing any kind of organizing. Uh, Ray, Ray and Andrea's work has just been uh, earth shattering and we, we, we desperately need more of it. Uh, Ray tells us that there's been an expansion of the grassroots relational organizing in Georgia for this, the, the 22 upcoming. And then of course in 24, we'll hope to be even bigger. This is nonpartisan, it's get out the vote. It's educational. Robert Wilson in North Carolina is, is carrying the ball there with Joel Siegel, and hopefully we can get it into every state. I just read a major piece, two major pieces in the Times, one about absolutely terrifying about Arizona, which we'll talk about, and then of course in Wisconsin, uh, where, where uh, these, these states can go one way or another, depending on get out to vote. Now, um, uh, Wendy Lederman, you are compiling a gra and by the way, the, the link to the video is also at our website, grassrootsep.org or uh, electionprotection2024.org. And so you can get the link there, or as I say, it's in the chat. Uh, Wendy Lederman, 
Can you tell us about this um, uh, grassroots uh, uh, directory that you're pulling together, the people, so we can contact grassroots organizations all yeah. over the country and people, if you are in touch or working with grassroots organizations, uh, doing great, get out the vote and canvassing and all those other great things, if you can send the links to Wendy, she will add them to the list. So Wendy, can you tell us a bit about what you're doing here? Sure, and I'm just putting my email in the chat right there and I'll do that again in a minute. Oh, sorry, my voice is a little scratchy. I've been sick all you're week. Good. So. You're good. Go <laughs> Thank ahead. you. Um, so yeah, exactly like Harvey just mentioned, um, it's a lot of the, uh, the grassroots groups. If you want, I can um, screen share and I can show you what I'm doing, but I can- Yeah, also... go ahead. Go ahead, okay. please do. So um, now we're starting with this. This is good. Okay, cool. This Let is me, the yeah. core of what we're doing here. So this is the beginnings. What we want to do is add um, um, a, a sentence or two of description of what each one of these groups does and how you get in touch with them. So you see a smart elections there. That's the great Lulu Freestad. She has a, a magnificent track record with her um, Zoom calls and uh, educational work right below her is Susan Pinchon, who's in Florida. Below her is John Brakey, who works with Emily Levy at Scrutineers. All these going on down are Revolution, League of Women Voters, Brennan Center, ACLU. These are key organizations that are doing relational grassroots organizing around the country. And we wanna be in touch with all of them. We will be having on the, um, at the end of the month, the uh, 29th, uh, in the first national grassroots Congress on uh, this kind of organizing. And this is the core list of organizations that will uh, be, be involved. And we're inviting everyone uh, who's doing this kind of work to, uh, to be able to speak for a couple of minutes. We are hoping that we, we have scheduled um, uh, the great Keith Ellison, the attorney general of the state of Minnesota to be a speaker on that a call and um, when um, Hetty Tripp, I'll have a letter to you tonight to send him with a more formal invitation. But as, as you can see, Wendy has compiled quite a few groups here. And if we can get them all linked in uh, to the likes of the organizing that Ray McClendon did uh, with, with Andrea in Georgia, uh, we can make a real difference in this election. And we're, uh, among other things, you wanna save the vid send the video uh, uh, to all these groups and then find more groups. Pizza the polls, uh, uh, hold the pepperoni on that, will you? So, um, you know, uh, look at this, this is fantastic. Wendy, uh, uh, Wendy's only been on this a couple of weeks. Look at this list of groups, grassroots groups around the country. So if we can get a one sentence description and the basic links of uh, phone numbers, um, e emails, websites, chats, all that stuff. Uh, look at Face United, hold it, go back a bit, Wendy. Fa Face United to Save Democracy. Now this is um, Barbara Williams Skinny. Jim, Jim Wallace is a longtime uh, nonviolent um, a spiritual activist. This is spectacular. So here we know what this group is. We know how to get a hold of them. And uh, this is what we want for all these groups. So um, Wendy, spectacular work. Thank God, you. it goes on and on, doesn't it? Look at this. Thank you so much. If I can just, uh, if I can describe this real quick. So um, what I just scrolled through is the index that you saw. And thanks so much, Harvey. I appreciate the kind of- Go for it, go for it, tell us. Thanks, thank you. Um, so yeah, I, I did that. That was the index that I put at the top. And as you saw, it wasn't alphabetized because it was just kind of going as I was going. And I have another spreadsheet here. I'll just show you real quick the spreadsheet. So you can see this is, um, this will be closer to the final product of what people will see. And this is what's alphabetized. And I'll have um, the contact information and um, a summary of the, um, the descriptions that I got and um, all the different contacts for that. So here I've just been kind of just going with the flow and I have um, about 450 right wow. now so far. yeah and um and so yeah the and these are i started off with people that are that are um close friends of the show 
But um, so I have all the, the um, grassroots groups for actual GOTV. I'm trying to get as many as I can from as many states as possible, um, especially, and even like, and where there's like low voter turnout, like in Texas, it has like really low voter turnout, the Asian population as well in all the states is low voter turnout, but, um, but everywhere. I, wanna, I don't wanna um, focus too much on any one particular thing. Um, but I'm also doing, um, there's a lot of like ancillary groups as well. And again, I'm not trying to spend too much time on that, but groups that are supporting the organizations as far as like tech goes and logistics. And there's also like postcards to voters and just different uncon unconventional um, methods. But um, I'm also doing some youth groups, not too many, but a lot of them, because you know the students can't vote, but they're the ones that are gonna make their parents vote. <laughs> and they're very active because it's their future. So they're very vocal about, they can still do get out the vote work even though they can't vote themselves. So I didn't wanna discriminate against them as well. And um, yeah, it's, that's, that's pretty much it. It's just, um, just trying to cover all the bases, mainly trying to stick with, um, with actual get out the vote, but then there's also a lot of groups that do um, like just research and analytics and, and those sort of things. So yeah, um, I put my, my uh, email in the chat and I'll put it there again. So if anyone has anyone that's working on um, groups or even groups that are activist groups that their prime focus isn't necessarily GOTV, but it GOT is involved in their work, then that's included too. So, um, so yeah. Wendy. Yes. Wendy, that's absolutely great. And we have to pay Wendy for all this hard work. We're not going to pay her a pittance like uh, neoliberals. We're going to pay her at a, a living wage rate. And in order for us to continue this great work like Wendy's doing, plus all these uh, Zooms that we're doing and connecting people who are making a huge difference, we need you to donate some money. We almost never do this, but we're getting a little bit low. So I just put a link in the chat. If you go to grassrootsep.org, you can donate there on the donation page. Uh, Grassrootsep—it's all one word.org slash donation. And Stephen just put a another alternative. If you look in the chat, you can send checks. Uh, Justin, I really appreciate it if you would support what we're trying to do. I know you support our mission, but our mission can't continue without generosity. So we're going to have a little mini pledge drive for another 30 seconds. But please, please, please donate now to keep these group uh, Zooms going so we can keep Wendy doing her excellent work. She just keeps scrolling and scrolling. We got to pay her. Amazing. We got to pay okay. her. So, so let's go. All right, thank you for that, Mike. We appreciate it. Um, we and we appreciate your support. Got two hands on this, uh, 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 um, Danette and then Sue. Danette. Hey, hey guys, Wendy, that freaking rocks, man. Thank I you. would like to offer my Excel spreadsheet skills and I would like to pop this into an Excel spreadsheet so we can um, oh. sort it, uh, unless you already have it in there. Yeah, I have one in Google. Um, I appreciate it, Danette, but thank you. Yeah, it's kind of like, um, I have one thing kind of, I, I really, really appreciate that. That's awesome. But um, I have a whole system going. So yeah, um, no worries. it's, yeah, it's like, what, like I have put one thing, like I, I'll have, I have everything that goes in here, then goes to the index. Then I have another index that is shared with the group. And then I oh, alphabetize perfect. them into this list. So it's oh, like- Oh, cool. So you can find it when you need to. Yeah. And it's perfect. like, it's all a house of cards. If one thing goes, then the whole arch is going to collapse. Oh, don't I do really that. appreciate that. I'll reach out. <laughs> okay, if very good. Great, yeah, great. If you change your mind, let me know. Thanks Annette, so much. Thank you. Yes. And Wendy is uh, available and, and uh, a very good communicator. So don't be shy. She's put her email in the chat and- um, but this is a spectacular jump forward here. This is what we're all about. Uh, Ray McClendon, this must look familiar to you, this kind of organizing. And so every one of these groups, any group that you know, we want to send that link, that uh, the link to the video and get them doing uh, whatever we can to do the grassroots relational organizing that will make the difference in 22. Sue Dorfman, Sue. Wait, you're muted. Hold on. 
Okay, go ahead, I think, ask, there you go. Um, one quick um, request to Wendy is if before the names of the people of all the organizations that are alphabetized, if you could put whether it's national or what state is it's located in, which would help for, since it's a spreadsheet, um, do a type of sorting, and then also it would be able to help tell what states are missing from the list in order to do a better job of finding states that um, may have some grassroots organizing but may not have anything in it. Um, just a very quick note, I was out in um, Wisconsin photographing the vote and um, I spent time with a group called Block, which Wendy has put on the list. Um, Block is a community-based organization um, that does phenomenal community organizing. And I just really want to give that shout out to local indigenous organizing that is done by people from the community is extraordinarily powerful in talking to the people that were going door to door organizing. These people were from the community. When asked about what got them involved, it was friends and family. When asked about what, whether their opinion of voting has changed to a person, they have all not only gotten themselves better educated, but they've educated them, their friends, they've educated their family. And so the ripple effect of the um, local uh, relational organizing is really pretty significant. A final note is Wendy continue, continue finding the organizations that are really reaching out to work with young people because young people will bring their parents to the polls. And given the lack of civic education in many parts of the country, any organization that can bring young people to the polls and get their parents to come along is well worth highlighting. Definitely. Fantastic. Beautiful work, Wendy. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Uh, Nancy Naparco, you've got your hand, Nancy. Nancy Naparco, did you raise your hand? Um, okay. uh, there we go. Um, I, uh, to support the fundraising and on that last moment, I want to offer that anyone who gives at least $20 Send me my, your your address and I'll send you this bumper sticker. It says, when young people vote, America wins. Uh, Bernie said that and your vote counts. And Dan, yes, Bernie. That's great, Nancy. Could you uh, help us with fundraising too? Because uh, like I said, we're running on fumes. Great. Sure. Thank you, we'll Nancy. Do. Nancy, you're wonderful. And uh, in the spirit of the great Will Ryan, um, uh, I wear his shirts regularly. <laughs> So thank you so much for that. Um, 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 sorry, we're, we're gonna. Does anyone else have anything they want to add to this incredible opener? Um, this is not what I planned, but it, it really worked out great. We're joined by the great Dennis Bernstein, by the way, the the host of the KPFK KPFA now on KPFK um, and other stations, um, um, uh, Flashpoint show. Uh, Tatanka Bricka, go ahead then. Dorothy Reich. Uh, great work, Wendy. Uh, inspiring. Carol and I will donate $100. Mazel tov. Thank you very much. Um, um, can I ask you, uh, Tatanka, can you make it 108? <laughs> I, lo I love the do donations that are 108. That's my standard uh, fee. And, and anybody, and well, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll fill you in. I can't resist. 108. Is a, a, a holy number in Buddhism, for some reason I never knew, and in Hinduism. It's also the number of, um, of beads on a rosary. And it's a, a, a sacred number in the Hebrew religion because in, in Judaism, uh, the, uh, in, in the Hebrew language, 18, the 18th letter is Chai, which is the name of God. So 108 is six names of God. And then finally, the kicker is that 108 is the number of stitches on a major league baseball. That kind of confirms everything. So there you go. So um, uh, folks, if you're going to do $100, uh, please do 108. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thanks for that, Tatanka. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, Dorothy, go ahead. No, Dorothy Wright. Can you hear me now? Does it sound yes, better? please. Uh, so yeah, I, I can constantly talk to people about this and you know sometimes at the office people say you shouldn't talk to the clients you shouldn't i say you have to we're in a crisis we can't 
not talk about it. We have to talk about it all the time to everyone who, and if they don't want to listen, you talk to them about it anyway, and just hope that they finally get through to them because we're in a crisis here. Boy, are we ever, we're gonna talk about that in a minute. Thank you, Dorothy, for that. Richard Langworthy, and then we're gonna go, uh, we have Zuri Pope on, we can talk about Ohio, and we've also been joined by the great Kevin Camps, um, and when we, okay. we're going to do a deep dive into nuclear. Uh, but go ahead, Richard okay. Langworthy. Okay, um, well, I've, I've, been, I've been seeing lots of worrying emails lately. I keep, say, see, keep seeing the Democrats are gaining grounds, the Republicans are gaining momentum, and I'm also really worried about this Supreme Court case. I can't case. hear Richard. Sluggo, can you hear him? Um, yes. And I'm really worried about this Supreme Court case that, which means they could rule to allow um, elections to be fixed in favour of the GOP. What can be done to prevent the GOP from winning again and make sure no one like Trump or DeSantis ever takes the White House well, again? We are, we are technically, we are technically nonpartisan. Um, so our answer for everything, thank you, Richard, um, our answer for everything is to get out the vote, get people educated, set up democracy centers, do what was done in Georgia in 2021, um, and, um, and just let the people decide. But uh, if you read today's New York Times, uh, the article about Arizona is absolutely terrifying. And um, um, you know we are seeing a major fascist groundswell in this country. And we got one of turn uh, to discuss that. I don't see any other hands at this point to Zuri Pope. I'm going to unmute you, Zuri. Uh, you are, uh, um, uh, have just published a piece in uh, The Nation about fascism in Ohio. Um, uh, can you uh, tell the 71 people that are with us and our listeners on YouTube and um, at uh, Progressive Radio Network uh, what you are seeing happening with the right wing in Ohio? Uh, sure. Uh, I was interested in three pieces of legislation that were going through Ohio State House, uh, 327, 616, and uh, 454. Uh, 327 would help uh, suppress the discussion of white supremacy in Ohio's classrooms. 616 would uh, hinder discussion of sexual orientation and gender identity, and 454 would ban uh, a transition and uh, medical care for uh, trans teens. All of these bills are taken directly from other bills uh, in other states. Don't say gay in Florida, of course, and uh, anti-CRT bills from across the country. Uh, a lot of people imagine that these bills are created by Ohio legislators looking at legislators in Florida or any other state and going, I should do something like that here. Uh, that's not the case. These bills are being pushed for and sometimes actively introduced by a group in Ohio called the Center for Christian Virtue. It's a center, it's a Christian fundamentalist organization. Uh, it was formerly designated as a hate group, in fact, uh, that has a tremendous amount of influence on the uh, Ohio legislature. They collaborate with lawmakers. They actively tell lawmakers which pieces of legislation uh, to pass. Uh, they actively uh, review uh, pieces of legislation that are written by lawmakers, and their goal is to uh, create a Christian nation, in other words. In fact, Jane Mayer interviewed Mr. Aaron Bear, uh, the head of the Center for Christian Virtue, who said that he wanted to have gay marriage overturned and that there should be no exceptions uh, for abortion, even in cases of rape or incest. And these people, thanks to uh, incessant uh, gerrymandering from the Republican majority in the state house were able to wield tremendous amounts of influence. Wow. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for your reporting. Can I ask you a personal question? How old are you? I'm 19. Okay. Uh, let me tell you also, you have a great radio voice. So I hope you go into public broadcasting, but I, I grew up in Columbus. You're in Cincinnati, right? Uh, that's right. So um, uh, having grown up in Columbus, uh, I saw the state of Ohio transition. Um, uh, at one point, we had a very liberal governor, Richard Celeste. He actually was a friend of Pete Seeger, 
the great folk singer. And we had a night where Pete uh, played downtown in Columbus and then came to the governor's mansion. And we had a hootenanny in the governor's mansion. We couldn't even begin to think about that now in Ohio, uh, although there is a competitive uh, US Senate race going on. So Zuri, your, your reporting from Ohio is critical. We also have in Ohio an astonishing battle over um, gerrymandering, where the voters of Ohio have twice approved um, a nonpartisan gerrymandering, a nonpartisan district drawing to get around gerrymandering. And the Republicans in the, in, in the legislature have completely ignored it to the point where they've drawn up map after map after map that totally uh, guarantees uh, a super majority right wing in the Ohio uh, legislature. I mean, I used to, when I, was going, when I was younger, I would go into the Ohio legislature and you could actually talk to legislators. And in recent years, I, I don't go, I didn't stop going in there. It was like night of the living dead. I mean, you know, it was like, yeah, it was like they had required a lobotomy to be a member of the Ohio legislature. And, um, and they, what's happened, and we've talked about this before, and Steve Caruso, of course, is very familiar with all this, is that the maps that have been drawn by the right wing in Ohio have been thrown out repeatedly by the Ohio Supreme Court, and the, the Republicans have ignored the Ohio Supreme Court and continue to regurgitate these far right um, um, gerrymandered maps. And at stake here, Ohio now has what, 13, I think, um, uh, seats, is that right? Um, in the Congress. And yes, uh, at stake in this gerrymandering fight is two, three, four congressional seats. And the, the Republicans are just completely ignoring the Supreme Court and ignoring the law. Is that a fair assessment, Zuri? Uh, I would say so. I mean, we are going into a midterm election in which the uh, maps that are being used are maps that were rejected by the state Supreme Court. And I've spoken to a number of Democratic Party officials, not for this story, but for other stories, who are despairing. They feel that this is a incredibly uh, uh, rigged system, and it's becoming increasingly difficult to fight against as a result of this partisan uh, gerrymandering uh, that you have mentioned. Uh, and so a lot of young people are actively protesting and, and rallying against it. I write about a protest that was held at the Columbus State House. I spoke to young people there uh, and they are outraged by the bills that are coming through the State House and outraged at how extreme the Ohio Republican Party and how authoritarian the Ohio Republican Party has become. And so I'm not sure if they'll be able to uh, change the political type. I do think that a strong opposition force is being created and it's being led uh, by Ohio's youngest citizens. Well, please make sure that w for Wendy's List and for our calls, and we'd be glad to have you back with other um, uh, young people who are organizing uh, in Ohio. Uh, Ohio has always been viewed as a swing state uh, and, um, you know, it, it will be again, hopefully, uh, one of these days. But um, uh, I, I witnessed, as someone who grew up there, uh, the, the transition of Ohio from a fairly diverse, uh, left-leaning state in many ways to uh, of what's presumed, what we're looking at here is a fascist takeover. We have encouraged, by the way, Andrea Miller to do some uh, grassroots organizing in some of the key uh, inner cities in Cleveland, Columbus, and elsewhere. And you need to be in touch with Andrea Miller, Zuri. So we will make sure that happens. Uh, email me, uh, solartopia at gmail, and uh, we'll make we'll get we'll get everybody together. And certainly email Wendy. Does anyone else want to jump in on Ohio yeah. here? Uh, Steve. Yeah. So uh, go. Uh, who's that? Hi, yeah, Danette. I have my hand up. Right, Danette, Steve, and Justin. Go ahead, Danette. Um. Yes. Uh, Zuri, you're amazing. Thank you so much. Um, I'm I'm sure that um, you need to run for office. You you really do. Like city council, I don't care what it is. Start somewhere. And do you have a large coalition of young people that you're working with? Um, and if so, um, we would love to have you on PDA's uh, town hall on Sunday to talk about this. 
Um, we're still on the brink, as we know, of losing our country. Um, and we need to fight these people every step of the way. They're so frightening to me. And uh, just keep on doing what you're doing. Um, I love it. And I just wish more young people would get involved. So thank you so much. Well, thank you, firstly, for uh, um, saying that I should run for office. I think my past is a bit too shady, or perhaps not shady enough uh, for that. <laughs> and as for whether I am a member of any student orgs that I'm working with, uh, this story was written on my own uh, for the nation, but I am a member of a student organization called the University of Cincinnati Young Democratic Socialists of America, which is the youth branch of the Democratic Socialists of America. They're actually on the list of organizations you want to reach out to. Uh, they do a lot of good work both on campus and in the Cincinnati area. Uh, and I am glad to be a member, so. Uh, Jury, you have seen the GOP, right? Don't worry about skeletons. <laughs> <laughs> put, the, put the link uh, to your article from The Nation in the chat, if you would. And then put the link as how people can get in touch with you. and. The LinkedIn and the, also the URL for that organization, that would be great. And of course, Wendy will add it to the list. Okay. Thank you for that, Zuri. Uh, um, Steve Caruso, also in Ohio. Yeah, the last uh, Supreme Court ruling for the, I believe it was fifth, sorry, maybe you know better, but I think it was the fifth time now, 30 days ago, almost 30 days ago, they rejected it. And so, 30 days, end of 30 days coming up, July 19th till August 19th, whatever. So we'll see what happens. I mean, they were going to hold them in contempt. Whether that's going to happen or not, we don't know. Right. And we got to remember, it was a Republican uh, uh, chief justice of the Ohio Supreme Court who has actually been the, the, the swing vote to reject these gerrymandered districts. And uh, the there is a, a Supreme Court. Uh, that seat is up for grabs in the 22 election. I hope people are focused because there's a huge difference between uh, Jennifer Bruner, who's running uh, uh, from the left, and uh, a woman named Kennedy, who is so far right, um, you know, she makes Trump look liberal. So uh, this is a big deal, Zuri, and I'm sure you're focused on that. Just I believe the there's three seats up for open. So they're right. running for both, all three. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Justin LeBlanc, then Dorothy Reich. Justin, go ahead. So the uh, quick bit of context for all this one, thank you, Zuri, for coming on this call. Uh, you're exactly the kind of individual that uh, Wendy uh, was talking about from her list of uh, needing to involve the youth uh, to talk, speak truth to power and out of the mouth of babes. But uh, I want to provide some context, even that may save America. A lot of the apartheid that was taking place in South Africa was under the guise of religious nationalism. And uh, so the free Nelson Mandela movement was actually started by three teenagers walking into a bank and convincing the uh, executives and the patrons that all the stories that had been told about them were lies. And that kicked off the, uh, the free Nelson Mandela and he became president and ended apartheid. Uh, now, bringing forward to America about the religious right, uh, we should really uh, start calling them the WASP uh, nationalists, and uh, specifically, th these are Puritans, they're not Christians, and they are uh, doing, here's the key term that you can use for anybody that you want to talk to about this stuff, they are reversing the course of the country. They're trying to make the Bible say what it doesn't say, or at least pretending it does, so that they can convince people to engage in all sorts of uh, regressive things rather than progressive things. So yes. they're, they're reversing. And, and they are indeed Puritans, and uh, their slogan is <clears throat> party like it's 1630. You know, when 1630, the Puritans came to Boston and they imposed a, an Orwellian dictatorial state totalitarian state uh, in the under the guise of religion. And uh, that's where it all comes from. Anybody want to read about that? Write me, I'll send you my book, The People's Spiral of US History. Zuri, I'll send you a free PDF, but uh, be careful because there will be a quiz. Um, 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 uh, it was never any good at this. <laughs> what's that? I was never any good at those, but hey. Oh, all right, well, you know, you're good enough. Uh, uh, Dorothy Reich, Dorothy, and then we're going to move on. 
Dorothy Reich, did you raise your hand? No? Okay. Um, uh, well, listen, um, we, we had uh, Bryn Tannehill scheduled. So Zuri, you'll put all your links. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we do have a quick uh, visit from uh, Suzanne Gordon, who's gonna talk about veteran issues. And then we're gonna go straight to Kevin Camps and do the deep dive uh, on nuclear power. Um, uh, Suzanne Gordon, are you with us? Uh, Kevin, can you stay? And Suzanne's having trouble with her audio. So Suzanne, pop up as soon as you can. Okay, all right. So um, I, I will want in the second hour, we want to have a round table on the, um, on the, the you know, we were every session uh, uh, having a round table open discussion on one six. And now we have the sequel to one six, which is the raid uh, on Trump and the, the boxes of documents really, really fascinating stuff. And then we'll get deep into that into the second hour, uh, just because I know everybody is going to want to vent and have something to say about it. Um, for now, we have a very, very serious issue. We've got Kevin Camps, Myla Reason, and Tatanka Bricka to talk us about what's happening with nuclear. We have a situation, of course, in, in Ukraine, where Zaporozhye, there was six reactors is now being surrounded and shells are flying all over the place. Absolutely terrifying. And in California, at the same time, people seem oblivious and want to continue operations at the Diablo Canyon nuclear plant, which is uh, surrounded by earthquake faults, while simultaneously, and Ron Leonard will talk to us about this, they're trying to kill solar energy in California. It's astounding to me uh, and probably to all of you. On the one hand, more nuclear. On the other hand, less solar. What, are, what is our species thinking about? So Kevin Camps, uh, you've got a, Kevin Camps is the great activist, uh, organizer, certainly a master of grassroots organizing at uh, Beyond Nuclear uh, from Kalamazoo, Michigan. Ke Kevin, uh, go ahead and tell us what's going on here. Then we'll go to Marla and Tatanka. Well, thanks good? a lot, Harvey. Okay, Can you hear me? Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was a good intro. Um, I mean, the situation in Ukraine is uh, nightmarish. I mean, as we speak, I I just checked Google to see if there was any new news, and I hadn't heard yet until I did that that um, you know the Russian defense minister is in a call with the uh, UN Secretary General about the situation at Zaporizhia. So it's just a sign of how serious the situation is. I mean, if you have the International Atomic Energy Agency testifying to the Security Council at the UN that the situation is completely out of control at Zaporizhia and it's a grave hour, you know it's bad because the IAEA is a pro-nuclear institution. And granted, even the nuclear establishment likes to avoid nuclear power catastrophes when it can because it's a really bad PR day for them and for their future. Um, it's just, it's, it's very frightening. Um, we can get more detail, but um, the situation at Diablo, which is um, kind of parallel to the situation, I'm speaking to you from Kalamazoo, Michigan, my hometown, it's parallel to the situation with the Palisades atomic reactor in Michigan, in that um, they're trying to bail out these atomic reactors, which are dangerously age degraded and keep running them for, not years, but perhaps even decades into the future. So the difference between Diablo and California, which is a, a two unit reactor complex and Palisades in Michigan, which is one reactor, is that Palisades supposedly permanently shut down after 51 years of operations on May 20th of this year. Diablo is supposed to shut its two units in 2024 and 2025, but around mid April, this, um, you know, bait and switch was played by the Democratic governors of Michigan, California, where all of a sudden they're leading the charge, asking the U.S. Department of Energy, which is headed by Jennifer Granholm, a former governor of Michigan, former attorney general of Michigan, to please bail out these reactors. Um, we're talking billion dollar bailout level per reactor, complements of um, U.S. federal taxpayers. And at Palisades, keep it running for nine more years. At Diablo, an indeterminate amount of time, breaking every rule to do this. 
And now with the passage, not only of the bipartisan infrastructure law, which is where the six billion was coming from to bail out Diablo and Palisades and perhaps others. Now you've got the um, Inflation Reduction Act, which just passed and is gonna be signed by Biden next week. And I saw a figure from NEARS, I don't know what all it includes. We used to say 53 billion more under the Inflation Reduction Act before that, it was the Bring Build Back Better Act. Now, NEARS has put a figure of $100 billion on the IRA in terms of old reactor bailouts. So we're talking about a round figure of about $100 billion, perhaps, to be thrown at old reactors, which are already in the breakdown phase, flirting with disaster just from breaking down. And now they're going to keep them running um, for who knows how long into the future. And it's not just Diablo, it's not just Palisades, it's reactors like Davis Bessie in Ohio, perhaps the most dangerous reactor in the country. Um, and there's others that could be added to that list. That, that's the kind of um, risk taking that the nuclear power industry, its lobbyists got its friends in Congress to approve and now Biden is gonna sign the deal next week. Right, it's insane. It's absolutely insane. I, I mean, beyond and infuriating. I want to mention, Kevin, that um, Dennis Bernstein, the great host of uh, uh, the uh, Flashpoint show, uh, has asked if you can join him at 5.20 p.m. So if you all Eastern time, oh no, that'd be uh, California time, be 8.20 your time. So if you can put your uh, contacts in the chat, uh, Dennis, you can get in touch with uh, Kevin that way. Okay, uh, by the reason, you are a longtime activist in California. You were on the big call uh, that they just had on Friday about Diablo. Um, do you wanna tell us um, uh, about that? We have 73 people on the call, by the way. Who is and, that, Harley? Uh, 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 Myla, Myla, are you still with us? Myla Reason? Luggo, we have Suzanne when you're ready. Okay, um, oh. it just took me, it, I had to get permission to unmute Harvey. Okay, At any rate, so um, as you know, Harvey, um, in California, we actually had a deal to shut Diablo in 2024 and 2025. So this would be if, if the uh, life of the, if those two decrepit, embrittled uh, atomic reactors is extended, that would be abrogating the deal that was already struck between a number of entities. So it would actually, from it's my understanding, take the approval of legislators in the state of California to approve of the deal. So uh, unfortunately in the past, what we've seen is that when we contact our legislators, they usually defer to the legislators from San Luis Obispo and the area around Diablo, which um, unfortunately are pretty much bought and paid for uh, by uh, people who are interested in keeping those plants open. So it's really important that we campaign uh, the, our, to make sure that our legislators understand that this is not a local, uh, an issue local to San Luis Obispo, that this would not only impact the whole state of California, but also the entire country should something go terribly wrong at Diablo. And um, if I may, I just wanted to touch a little bit on the uh, California Energy Commission hearings that, um, that you attended and that many of us attended. They went on for hours and hours and hours. And what I noticed was that the, uh, the public commenters were pretty evenly sp split by a very well-informed citizen activists who, uh, who provided important information about why we not only need to um, keep the schedule to retire these two decrepit reactors by 2024 and 2025, but it would actually, my, my position is that they should be shut immediately because they could blow up at any time. They're on a uh, nest of earthquake faults and, and they're simply, the plant is simply not engineered to withstand the kind of ground motion that would occur should there be a major quake. So um, it's really risky and unnecessary to keep them running. And if I, if I could just talk a little bit about all of the no. extraordinary, pardon me, Real, real quick, I agree with you a thousand percent. And I just put a link in the chat where people can send a direct email 
Governor Newcom Newsom. Thank you, Mike. Thank you for that. And yeah, also, you, Suzanne, Suzanne Gordon, uh, I guess the technical difficulties have been cleared. If you can stay with us through this discussion of nuclear power, we will get to your veterans' issues. If, if, if I might just yeah. continue a little longer. Yes, no, go ahead. That's okay. go ahead. The so, so, uh, so it was uh, pretty much evenly split between people who were coming with uh, um, well-informed uh, concerns and information about the uh, necessity to shut Diablo. Um, and then uh, a, a large number of people who were just spewing nuclear propaganda. And it was just pretty extraordinary to me to hear all of the pro-nuclear people. And it makes me wonder whether the legislature and the governor will hide behind all of the lies that were once again advanced by the pro-nuclear people. And one of the ones that I focused on was the uh, assertion that was made by uh, several people that in Texas during the big storm of uh, 20 that happened around February of 2021, when um, uh, uh, as many as, you know, 300 or more people actually lost their lives uh, because uh, they were not prepared for the kind of winter storm that occurred in Texas. And um, windmills and gas facilities and the nuclear facility were not winterized and they were not prepared for that kind of weather. And, um, and in particular, I kept hearing this uh, lie repeated that somehow yeah. that nuclear had survived that winter storm and it simply was not true. The unit one of the big uh, nuclear power plant in Texas uh, suffered a, uh, a failure of the feed water pump that is directly related to preventing that nuclear reactor from shutting down. That nuclear reactor provided, um, according to the, the operator, uh, provided uh, electricity for about a million or more households in Texas. And it went down for 63 hours during that storm. And it was a major factor in people losing their lives. And yet during those hearings that we had on Friday, we kept pe hearing people lie about what happened in Texas. And it just goes to show you, you know, they just, they, they, there's no bottom, there's no uh, shame and, um, and people fall for it. They fall for the, the claim that they're, it's carbon free, nuclear is carbon free. Right. They fall for the claim that it's safe, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So thank you very much for letting me. Thank you, Lila. And thanks for your persistence on that call. I was in line, but I had to leave. Probably uh, I would have lasted about 10 seconds uh, uh, with screaming obscenities. But you, you know what you say about Texas is absolutely true. The big lie in Texas started with Tucker Carlson, who got on TV and said, oh, look, the shutdown of the windmills in Texas caused all this blackout, never mentioning that South Texas nuclear plant uh, froze, for God's sakes, and was completely offline and, and could have blown up because, of the, as, as you say, the safety feed water pumps froze up. Uh, Tatanka Bricka, uh, you're next. Uh, with, uh, and, um, you know, nobody knows more about what's going on in California, and thank you for your donation, by the way. So go for it, uh, Tatanka. Okay, I just got unmuted. Thank you, Steve. Okay, Sluggo. Um, not insane at all. It's insane to sane people, but sane to totally insane people, okay? It's a death economy that's authoritarian versus a life democratic economy. This is a direct attack on democracy. I found out in sitting through the CARB, the uh, California Air Resources Board hearings, um, several of them, the massive influence of the oil and gas industry on in California. And it took young people to reveal the fact that by 2050, as they say, they pride themselves as, as being the most progressive in the world on a sustainable economy. By 2050, they show no no sign in reducing the number of oil refineries in California. In fact, they're building them up for the next 25 years. Okay, so there's a simultaneous attack on 
distributed energy on rooftop solar. They're not against big solar plans that can be metered by PG&E. So the attack is to limit distributed energies of any and all kinds, chief among them rooftop solar, which is the cheapest, most democratic, most reasonable way to build a sustainable future, not dependent on big utility mafia and lawlessness, and push nuclear back onto us now that they may not have to face the financial liability that's been staring them in the face with decommissioning, getting the bailout, as, as our friend talked about. So it's another massive attempt to go, go on with the, the policy of privatizing the profits for the big corporations, that is bail out the most expensive and dangerous method to boil water known to man. Because let's be honest about the source of this. The only reason for the existence of nuclear power is to create fissile material for nuclear weapons. And the USA has just begun a whole new $2 trillion, they call it nuclear upgrade. It's not upgrade. It's a new nuclear arms race. It's a total higher level of technology with AI that is requires a total creation of a new nuclear arms race. So the elite messaging strategy in steer fill, fear in California, they say we're gonna need all these kilowatt, uh, kilowatts at a time in the late afternoon when the fires are going and you're really gonna need energy and you're gonna need to be able to provide water and air conditioning. And while they're attacking rooftop solar to try to make sure that you don't have enough, they're saying nuclear will fill the bill. Yeah, it's really sick. They're starting with fear and then diversion. If you go online right now and you Google what's going on with Diablo Canyon, you get the corporate message for the first six, eight things. Here's the first one, carbon-free California. Let's keep Diablo Canyon open. Safe and reliable electricity. That's the headline. So the diversion is let's focus on carbon as the bad guy. Let's ignore all the dangers of nuclear power or any connection with nuclear weapons and any connection between the two. But they're linked as far as the big Davos, Great Reset folks that, want, that love Biden's plan they want to take until 2050 and beyond to merge nuclear and coal and oil into a plan to eventually get us, quote, sustainable future. So if they keep us focused on carbon, rather than, as you know, it's a sitting nuclear weapon itself, that's their strategy. Thanks Thank to you, Tom. Tom. I just Thank want to break in for one second. Bryn Tannehill is here. Okay, well, well, we'll finish with our nuclear discussion. And Bryn, thanks for joining us. And we'll get back to you and Suzanne Gordon. Uh, Kevin Camps, did you want to uh, throw something in before we go to our additional hands? We've got uh, Wendy and Ron. Uh, Kevin, did you want to jump in with anything before we proceed? Um, well, just uh, about the situation in Zaporizhia, I'll try to put it in the chat, but Greenpeace International has been doing some great work in Ukraine, including they took a trip to Chernobyl with radiation uh, monitoring specialists and were able to rebut the International Atomic Energy Agency, which had been there just a couple months earlier saying everything was fine. So Greenpeace did find elevated radioactivity levels all over the place due to the Russian military occupation, which ended a couple months ago, which enabled them to go in with the Ukrainian government's permission. So that's a really enlightening report and um, they've been raising the alarm about Zaporizhia and other Ukrainian nuclear power plants since the beginning of the war. And um, it's hard to exaggerate. I put it in the chat, but if you consider, you know, six reactors at Zaporizhia, Zelensky warned on the first days of the seizure of Zaporizhia that that, that attack had risked six Chernobyls at Zaporizhia. But in addition to that, if you look at the pools, which contain decades worth of high level radioactive waste and storage, you've really got at least dozens of Chernobyls, if not more possible at Zaporizhia in a worst case scenario. The pools are not even located within radiological containment structures. They're just in industrial warehouse buildings. So any fires or explosions there are directly into the environment. So um, it's, uh, you know, I, on the Tom Hartman show the other day, I said it could be an extinction level event for Europe and perhaps Russia. 
and he pushed back on me. But to even have to argue whether or not it's an extinction level event is kind of telling, I think. Unbelievable. Um, Wendy, then Ron Leonard. Uh, Harvey, can I make one comment before we go on? Please. Um, thank you, Kevin. And thank you for mentioning Greenpeace. They do great work and that's in particular and for really explaining the situation very well. I just want to say that the obvious twin dangers that humanity face, nuclear extinction and the climate crisis are linked and they don't want us to think at all about nuclear and they wanna you know, focus on being a solution. The, these are the energy giants I'm talking about. So if we get back to a campaign to abolish nuclear weapons, we have to decommission all nuclear. Oh, very right. And then, and, and then we free up to actual talk about sustainable energy. That's right. And I'm when the nuclear industry talks about finding global warming, they conveniently neglect the fact that all atomic reactors operate at 571 degrees Fahrenheit. Somehow you're going to cool the planet by with 400 radioactive fires at 570 degrees Fahrenheit. Unbelievable. Wendy, then Ron Leonard, and then we'll get to Brandon and, and Suzanne as soon as we can. Go ahead, Wendy. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll try to be really quick at just a couple quick points. Thank you so much, Kevin. We really appreciate having you here. Um, so I don't know, my chat's been going crazy, so I don't know if I, um, if, if I missed it, but I know Europe is talking again about nuclear weapons because of um, Russia. Um, another thing is, um, I've noticed that the the anti, the pro nuclear like on the ground level is like they're very cult like, and what I'm seeing because they're pushing for like the micro nuclear plants now, and um and I'm wondering like if the producers of these um micro small scale plants are making political donations to um the like Newcomb and, and all these um, people that we're seeing. And then just one other thing, I, I came across Beyond Nuclear um, because of the amazing work you guys did. I'm in Miami right now, and you guys were really successful with getting the feds to shut down or to cancel an extended lease on Turkey Point because of climate change, and it wasn't prepared to handle the flooding or if there's a hurricane or anything. So if maybe, Kevin, you could maybe just speak to that really quickly on how um, you guys were able to make that happen, and if maybe that could be replicated elsewhere. And thank you so very much again for being with us. Appreciate you. Thank you. Um, at Turkey Point, other groups were involved too, like Natural Resources Defense Council and Friends of the Earth. And other reactors besides Turkey Point were kind of in play, like uh, Surrey in Virginia, um, Peach Bottom in Pennsylvania. And what it was was an attempt by the nuclear industry at these plants and in complicity with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to grant not 40 years of operations, not 60 years of operations, but 80 years of operations. And they were playing fast and loose with National Environmental Policy Act requirements to look at the consequences of doing that. They thought they could get away with it. But due to this coalition effort across the country on these 80-year license applications, we were able to catch them in misbehavior under the law. The and problem. even the NRC commissioners had to admit that, that what they were doing was uh, unacceptable. And they voted at the NRC commission level to take a couple of years try to get their ducks in a row legally under National Environmental Policy Act, and then proceed to try to, you know, ram through these 80-year licenses. So it's a rare victory to slow them down even for a couple years, and uh, we'll just have to keep at it. And um, was there a second question I'm forgetting? Um, I just, I, I think I just... Oh, small yeah. modular reactors. Yeah, yeah. the modular reactors. I'd say abs... I'd say the nuclear power industry, including the small modular reactor industry, are one of the biggest players in Washington, D.C. in terms of campaign contributions. They also are at the state political level. So, yes, your question is absolutely yes. Uh, the lobby is how they get their way, and they, they buy off members of Congress, they buy off the executive branch, they buy off governors, state legislatures. The list goes on. Unbelievable. Ron Leonard? Ron, one of the great experts in the solar industry. We're in losing Suzanne, so we, we need her to go next, but we'll get right back to Ron if we can. Okay, Ron Leonard, go ahead. Ron Leonard? Please. Hi. So uh, two great things, Kevin, you did a great job. 
didn't mention that they actually put out a number. The number is 90 megawatts of nuclear power plants that they would like to commission and install on our grid in the United States. To give you a number, uh, the entire state of New York only uses 30 gigawatts. Uh, so we're talking multiple states worth of uh, highly contentious and untested nuclear power plants that uh, suck billions of dollars away from doing what we should be doing, which is installing clean, reliable, renewable energy. And if you want to look at what that's uh, about, it's in the chat. Also in the chat is the uh, science-based fact that we are having a webinar tomorrow showing how you can go 100% renewable energy. And you know, facts are important. When you look at Texas and they blamed wind for the grid failure, Texas never had more than 10% of their power from wind. It's a joke. Right. Uh, so we really need to rely on facts. We really need to stop the steal from renewable energy to nuclear power. I like that. Okay, well, listen, we're going to wrap this section. Kevin, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, do connect with Dennis Bernstein. Get on his show tonight. And, uh, you know, the bottom line here, we'll continue this next week is we have a country that is a, 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 a ruling structure. Someone's got to mute. A ruling structure that is simultaneously fighting against solar power while promoting nuclear power. It's the, it's the essence of suicidal insanity. And I will end by saying that not only do we need rooftop solar, but we need floating solar panels on all the reservoirs and all the aqueducts. Floating solar panels operate better because they're cooled and they cut evaporation of water uh, by 50%. It's a no brainer. It's got to move ahead. We will continue this next week. Thank you so much, Kevin, Myla, Tatanka, uh, Ron, and uh, Wendy, everybody else for this fantastic discussion. Uh, Kevin, be sure to put the uh, links to uh, Beyond Nuclear and Be Beyond Nuclear and yourself personally in the chat so that people can get a hold of you and uh, do connect with Dennis. Thank you, everybody, for this great uh, discussion. We're going to move on. We have uh, Suzanne Gordon has been waiting, and then we'll talk to Bryn Tannehill. Uh, Suzanne Gordon, you are working with veterans. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Great. Yeah. Okay, you are working with veterans. We have 74 people on the call. Um, uh, can you give us a brief um, uh, overview of what is happening with uh, the veterans issue and how it relates to grassroots organizing? Right, well, um, as people may or may not know, um, the Veterans Health Administration is the largest healthcare system, only publicly financed integrated healthcare system in the United States. And the same people that are trying to privatize everything else are trying to private and profit from everything else and defeat Medicare for all, uh, attack any involvement of government in healthcare are trying to privatize the Veterans Health Administration. And it's funded by the hospital industry, the pharmaceutical industry, and the Koch brothers or Kochs, um, uh, um, uh, efforts to um, are financing various groups that are attacking the VA and trying to take the, the $100, $100 billion or more budget and put it in the hands of private profiteers. Um, the latest iteration of this effort was uh, what was called the Asset and Infrastructure Review Commission that was part of the VA Mission Act that was the Trump era signature veterans legislation that was tragically passed with the support of the majority of Democrats in the House and the Senate. And they were gonna set up a commission that was gonna look at VA facilities and decide which to close and how to outsource more care. Um, the effort was defeated after um, groups like the one I work with, Veterans Healthcare Policy Institute, the American Federation of Government Employees and other unions really launched a major campaign to stop the closure of hundreds of VA facilities around the country, many of them in rural areas where there is no healthcare available. And um, 
and finally, uh, after just months of organizing, grassroots organizing at facilities all over the country, and, and, and they were fighting, there were many Democrats that supported this, and it was only because of this grassroots organizing that finally uh, Senator John Tester from Montana and 12, and Joe Manchin, if you can believe it, um, joined together and, and, and killed the commission. But there are many people fighting for the uh, recommendations that, you know, Joe Biden, secretary of the VA, he was the one who used Trump era consultants data recommending closures and outsourcing. And he continued to implement uh, the, this so-called air process and the Trump era recommendations for facility closures and outsourcing care to the private sector. Um, and basically Manchin and these 11 other senators stopped him. But people like Debbie Washerman Schultz are still basically supporting this kind of outsourcing. I mean, she gets thousands of dollars from the hospital industry. Um, she is funded by Cerner, which has okay. is another uh, pri privatization so, effort in the VA. So basically, grassroots organizing has stop this. And it's really, really important for healthcare reform activists to know about this fight to save the VA, because in my experience, many healthcare activists and reform, reform uh, advocates don't really know much about the VA and often believe some of the kind of Koch brothers funded propaganda that you hear in NPR and, and, and Washington Post and, and that sort of thing. And they, and it's, a very important struggle, a uh, grassroots struggle that's ongoing because even though this iteration has been um, stopped, the outsourcing efforts are ongoing and they are supported by Republicans and Democrats alike. Suzanne, it's a brilliant presentation. Thank you so much. If you will post, please, the, the links to how people can follow this issue. I'm sorry, but I, I'm terribly sorry, but I'm in a car. It's veteranspolicy.org. V-E-T-E-R-A-N-S-P-O-L-I-C-Y.org. Yes, veterans, oh. it's the Veterans Healthcare Policy Institute. Veterans, okay, uh, uh, Steve or, or Mike, Veterans Healthcare Policy Institute. Okay, thank you so much. Veterans policy.org. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, of something we haven't dealt with. And of course, veterans are an important uh, uh, voting constituency in this country, and they need to be part of our grassroots effort. Uh, Wendy, if you can do well, that. Well, and also, if, it, if we don't save these government programs, it's going to really piss off more and more veterans who are then going to go hard right option. And so I think it's really important. They're they're not they're, you know, veterans help push Biden over. And um, if we don't get veterans on our side, the, the right wing will be try to get them on their side. And also, if we don't, uh, you know, rehabilitate and respond to these attacks on the VA, then there will be nobody to rebut that in in the public narrative and the public discourse. Thank you very much. Beautifully spoken, Suzanne. I hope you'll join us on our calls in the future. Um, and please drive. Sure. Please drive carefully. Uh, Dorothy Reich has a hand thank before you. we go to Bryn Tannehill. Dorothy, thank you. Dorothy Reich. Uh, let's see, asked to unmute. Okay. Here we go. There we go. Yay. Here I yeah, am. you're good. Okay. So, um, couple of things I just I posted an article a couple of times already in the chat about they're just finding out at Washington Post how much the, the Trumpers were able to infiltrate the voting machines get access to voting machines in the various states so that's a big article I haven't finished reading it but uh, you guys need to look at it um, as far as the veterans um, if Susan would Suzanne would just be in contact with me. I'm pretty tight with Ted Lou, and he's on the Veterans Affairs Committee, and I'm sure he would be happy to help us with that. Okay, Suzanne. Well, I'm Mike Hurts. You have the contacts. 
for Suzanne as well, if you can make sure, uh, and Steve, that those contacts are sent to Dorothy Reich, that would be great. And I can certainly testify that Dorothy has worked closely with Ted Lou. Uh, so that, that's great. Thank you for that, Dorothy. Ruth Strauss had her hand up. <laughs> oh, okay, Ruth, go ahead. And then we're gonna go to Bryn Tannehill. Go ahead, Ruth. Ruth Strauss. Um, I don't see her hand up anymore. Okay, um, okay. So let's go to Bryn, then we'll get back to Ruth. We have 76 people with us. Uh, Bryn Tannehill, um, uh, if you'll introduce yourself, we want to start a discussion now of the, uh, of the fascist movements. We had a report from Ohio uh, at the, at the uh, uh, beginning with Zuri Pope, and now you've joined us. So uh, tell us, uh, you've been with us before. We're glad to have you back. So Thank you. Update us on the latest, please. So I think what everybody, at least I'm most interested in, is what's going on with Donald Trump and the materials that have been pulled out of his uh, home in Mar-a-Lago. Uh, what we are seeing are reports that it, some of the materials that have been removed, uh, and there's been a grand total of at least 27 boxes, uh, first in January of this year and then just a few days ago, uh, contained numerous highly classified documents. Uh, between Newsweek and the Washington Post. Reportedly, those documents included uh, nuclear secrets uh, and uh, payroll information on US intelligence assets in other countries. Uh, he's been charged, the warrant for the search uh, included three potential crimes, which included, um, which included invoking the Espionage Act um, there's been a lot of wrangling online about what that means and whether or not he can, uh, as he claims, unilaterally declassify any document he wants at any time, uh, simply with the power of thought, um, which is ridiculous. Um, but there's a lot going on that when I'm having conversations with constitutional scholars, uh, that is, that's not making it to the national media. And that's the, that's the really dangerous part here. Well, let's hear it. You know, they, you know, everybody, this is going to be a long discussion now uh, because uh, this is key. This is what's making the news. Uh, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Bryn, but it would seem to me that now that they've broken into Mar-a-Lago and have the documents, that there needs to be an indictment uh, within uh, as soon as possible. So if you put that, mix that into your discussion, that would be great. But go ahead. Sure, I can, I can address that. So, um... They're trying to be very methodical. It was found out today that Trump, uh, that the FBI took both of his passports, right, which is interesting. Uh, it suggests that they thought he was a flight risk. Um, I have my sources telling me that there's other things that they took from Trump that Trump has not released yet or admitted to yet. Um, but th these, these are good sources and I'm not gonna say what they took. But uh, he does have reason to be very, very worried. But uh, conversely, um, talking to constitutional scholars, he does have um, some defenses that are particularly potent. And right now there's reasons why uh, Department of Justice is very concerned about indicting him. Uh, the most, first and foremost is the fact that um, we're already seeing uh, indications and warnings of potential violence that would make January 6th look like child's play um, if Trump gets, uh, gets indicted and then has to surrender himself to uh, federal authorities. But what's even more frightening is the possibility that he has, that he gave these secrets or sold these secrets to a hostile foreign power. What gets even scarier is if he did it in that brief period before he left office, right? Because then he gets to make a novel but potentially successful legal claim, namely that presidents cannot be tried for things that they did while in office because the only legal mechanism to try a president for crimes committed in office is impeachment. The impeachments failed, Therefore, there is no, uh, no ability of the federal government to impeach him for crimes committed while in office. Uh, and you can make a pretty good case that you don't want 
um, state or federal authorities to be able to try a former president because uh, for things they did while in office, because what if Texas decides to um, have Joe Biden arrested and executed for jaywalking, right? Uh, after he leaves office, you don't want that sort of thing, right? So you can, and we have a, we have a Supreme Court that would be very, very sympathetic to such arguments, right? So you end up with this potential, potential uh, of the Supreme Court saying, well, yeah, there's a mechanism. They tried to use that mechanism. It failed. That, that is the only mechanism to use against a, for crimes committed while being a sitting president. And there's a lot of legal scholars that I've talked to that say, yeah, that, that he's very likely to be successful if the crimes he committed happened while he was president, particularly the worst of which might, which might be that he gave secrets to say Saudi Arabia or uh, Russia, right? So we could have a president who literally committed treason and is also completely immune from prosecution for committing the absolute worst treason in US history, right? This would be far more, the, the level of classification of the documents he had goes beyond what the Walker spy ring gave to the Soviets during um, the Cold War. Well, we also, now, and this, I've seen this discussed in the media, and by the way, Bryn, will you give uh, a real quickly your credentials, because there's a reason that we've asked you to join us, well, your book, and, and so on. So my name is Bryn Tannehill. Uh, I was a naval officer. I uh, flew helicopters and on uh, maritime patrol aircraft. I was a campaign analyst for Fifth Fleet uh, during the time period 2005-2006. Uh, I work for, you know, I work, I've worked in defense industry for the past 10 years as a analyst. Um, and I will note that any and all opinions, thoughts, and whatever else expressed are mine and mine alone. Okay. So, and you, you have a deep background in this, uh, um, uh, uh, deep, deep stake kind of stuff. We'll put it that way. There is an instance, um, where treason was committed where there by, by an incoming president uh, in the 1968 election, nobody disputes it anymore. And there were documents taken that were relevant. And this is the intervention of Richard Nixon into the Vietnam peace talks during uh, the last month of the 1968 presidential campaign in which Nixon uh, urged the South Vietnamese to not make peace and to end the war in Vietnam. And he wanted them to prolong the war in Vietnam so that he would win the 1968 election. And this is treason. There's absolutely no way, no doubt about it at all that this was treason. There were documents that were taken from the White House uh, rel relative, relevant to this act of treason. And what happened? Nixon was pardoned um, and you know they got him for Watergate but they never got him for the major act of treason that he committed. So I'm going to I'm going to stop you right there. The level of damage and level of information by Trump that may have may have been given to foreign adversaries goes far what Nixon did was wrong it was illegal but this is orders of magnitude worse speaking as as someone who's been involved in national security for a very long time can you can you elaborate at all um so when you talk about nuclear secrets uh you are talking about specifications capabilities manufacturing of u.s nuclear weapons right um you are talking uh, about the, if the Newsweek information is correct, payroll and salary for U.S. intelligence assets overseas, it could potentially mean that every U.S. asset overseas has been rounded up and executed or thrown in a hole to be tortured, right? This is, this are, these are crown jewels of U.S. secrets. Uh, and the amount of damage that, that can be done to the U.S. here is, incalculable and it definitively would interfere with US uh, ability to function 
at a national security level going forward if these things fell into the wrong hands? <laughs> uh, well, you know, okay. Uh, that's about as uh, brutal a summary as you can get. Uh, Dennis Bernstein, uh, uh, did you wanna uh, pipe in here with Bryn Tannehill? Dennis Bernstein, host of uh, Flashpoints on uh, Pacifica. Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear go me? Go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I, I just, when we think about Trump, who we know is a walking criminal conspiracy. <laughs> and, you know, you, you can see that, for, for instance, the case just took a big leap in Atlanta. Uh, I, my point here is that I'm, I'm not anxious in putting all my eggs in one bastard or something like that. I'm, I'm a little nervous about getting involved. The espionage laws are shady and shaky and in themselves hard to impose. If we get swept away into an espionage investigation, or we might lose the focus. So I, you know, I, I'm keeping an eye on all of it, but there are other investigations at this point that will be much more uh, effective at holding Trump accountable and stopping him and stopping him again from running again. So I, that's what I'm saying. It's all, Actually, the espionage, all the espionage stuff is interesting. And if, I'm sure also a part of that is the long time deep secret unadmitted relationship that Israel has with the United States in the context of nuclear weapons in which the United States still does not want people to understand one, how they help Israel create that weapons policy and now how they are literally nuclear renegades. There's a lot of things that could come out of that. Um, uh, what's secret, not secret, what they don't want to come out. It's not all simply, uh, you know, sort of stuff defending the U.S. Uh, national security. So, Dennis. Yeah. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, go ahead, Bryn. So uh, what I think you're failing to appreciate here, um, and perhaps I should be more explicit in the consequences, second order and third order effects of what we're seeing going on here, right? If you cannot charge a sitting president with any crime ever, unless you manage to successfully impeach him, which means you need that, you need, I believe, a supermajority in the Senate, you're never going to get that with the US as polarized as it is. We are on the verge of implementing a dictatorship the next time we have a Republican president. He can literally have Democrat leaders. As long as he's the one pulling the trigger, he can shoot them in the face. He could have, he could have any government official shoot Nancy Pelosi and immediately pardon them. Right? You're failing to grasp the magnitude of the danger that we are in here with a ruling that gives the president carte blanche to commit crimes while president, as long even after he is no longer president. This is extraordinarily dangerous, right? Um, it sets us up for things that are beyond bad. <laughs> um, well, basically he, you're saying that why would Donald Trump leave, leave the White House with 11 boxes of documents that would include hyper secret information about how we make our nuclear weapons? What, what is the possible motivation for doing that? There's some of the things that were hauled out of his house were things that were keepsake and mementos, like the letter that Kim Jong Un wrote to him, and and some <laughs> golf, and a little model of Air Force One that was painted up in the new colors that he wanted. Like those are mementos. Those those have some kind of um, sentimental value, right? Um, you don't have sentimental value placed on you know, schematics of nuclear weapons, right? You don't have sentimental value on payroll for US intelligence assets overseas, right? So the only possible reason you would have these things is something like either you intend to give them away or you intend to use them as blackmail. One of the other things that we do know was hauled out of there were, were uh, US intel, um, US intel or secret documents related to France's President Macron, right? 
um, which might it might have been intended for blackmail purposes, right? Um, so the the level of danger we're in here is is impossible to overstate. Um, and I think I think that's what the big takeaway is here. It's not that um, Espionage Act is, is there's better, better avenues. I would also mention that the law regarding the mishandling of government documents, right? Actually, that's one of the only ways we're going to prevent him from ending back up in office again is if we convict him of that because that law specifically prohibits you from running for holding office again. And it's one of the only laws out there with that penalty, which by the way, Donald Trump signed that law into place because of Hillary's emails, right? Um, as, as he basically wanted to give justification to lock her up, uh, signed that into law, and now he's gonna be subject to the law, that same law, which would prevent him from holding office ever again. Um, and here's the thing, is that if what I'm saying, if, if our worst fears are true, then the Department of Justice the, and the intelligence community, Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Defense, know they're on a two-year countdown to make sure that Trump never holds office again or the U.S. becomes effectively a, a, a vassal state of Russia, All right? And right. that's... That would be if if he has given this stuff to the wrong people, right? Then then we are we are on a countdown to extremely bad things and going down a rabbit hole that that is even more dreadful than what I envisioned in my book American Fascism. Well, let's continue this discussion. Uh, let's continue it um, um, recorded because. I think it might be of use to people, Mike, if that's okay, Steve, if we can continue to record this, we'll go up to the top of the hour. Uh, we've got a lot of hands up. Uh, Ruth Strauss, uh, Eric, uh, Stephen Kaiser, Danette. Uh, Ruth Strauss, go ahead, please, for Brent Tannehill. Are you with yes, us? Yes, thank you. Um, Bryn, this is very, unfortunately, interesting. Yeah. Uh, I had not heard um, the, the part about if he did this while he was in office. So my No, this is speculation. This is speculation oh, of, speculation. okay, he has this stuff and okay, well, why would he keep it? Well, and it actually matters if he gave it to somebody, it matters when he gave it to them, whether he was already out of office or whether he was still in office. If it was, well, well he was still in office. Like, the guy is in inchoate liar. So, I mean, how, what would be the recourse for him to say, I gave it while I was in office and how would one? Okay, so I think we understood, Ruth, you kind of went away. Um, so um, how does he, well, here, the question becomes really, who is gonna try him? If he's entitled to a jury of his peers, uh, is it, wouldn't he have to go in front of a military tribunal? No, he wouldn't. Um, there's actually something called SIPA courts. So uh, SIPA, I can't remember the exact acronym, but it's like a, a, it's a set of additional rules that you put on top of uh, a court where some of the evidence is classified, right? That gives CIPA. Um, CIPA. CIPA. And what it is, is it's special rules on how to run a courtroom where some of the evidence is classified, right? And it runs pretty much exactly like a regular court, but then you have um, rules for what the jury can see and how to handle the classified evidence and finding ways to declassify the information to the maximum extent practical so that the jury can actually understand what's going on, right? Um, where, well, where is the likeliest court? If Merrick Garland suddenly develops a backbone and, and, and actually indicts Trump, and politically, I don't know how they can wait another week after, after doing this raid to indict so, him. If they don't indict him soon, it's going to be an admission that it was a failed raid. So happen? there's two things about that. Well, three things. One, it'd be, uh, it would be in a DC court because the crime occurred when he took things off of um, the off of White House grounds. 
um, from my would understanding. Be, would it, would it, sorry, would it be a federal court? Yes, it'd be right, federal right. court. All right. Federal right. court, probably DC, DC, uh, not DC circuit, but DC, uh, district of DC. Um, the, the because he is going to have trouble fleeing, um, they've taken his passports. <laughs> they are also um, being extremely cautious. Th this investigation is moving very, very slowly, given the materials involved, right? Because and also given the person involved. So they're being extremely slow, extremely methodical, because if they decide that they need to bring this to an indictment, they want to be 100% sure that they have not, that they've, they've dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's, right? Do they um, have, what, what, what kind of grand jury do they have to go to to get to an indictment? Um, they're going to have to have a grand jury that is cleared to look at the evidence or a grand jury that's under the SIPA rules. Wow, mind boggling. Okay, let's go to um, um, uh, Eric Lazarus hasn't spoken yet, then Stephen, then Danette, then Justin, then Dorothy. Go ahead, Eric. Um, quick point, um, I assume people have heard that none of these three charges require um, the material to be classified. Um, in fact, I think the Espionage Act predates our, our current notion of classification. So it's not a shock that it's not in there. Um, right. It had, the other thing is, I'm not personally worried that he's given away more secrets um, since he left the presidency, given that he gave. What happened here? Uh, Eric? Very high level clearance. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, um, yes, given that he gave um, um, high level um, access to his son-in-law, who was known to uh, owe hundreds of millions of dollars or more uh, to oil sheiks and couldn't get security clearance the legit way, we have to assume that uh, the administration was already leaky, extremely leaky already. Uh, I guess those are the two yeah, points Trump I Yeah, Trump had make. no Thanks. problem with exposing classified material while he was in office or declassify, trying to declassify it on the fly. Uh, Kushner just got a $2 billion deal with the Saudis. Um, but regarding whether the classification level, yes, that's true, but that's not the crux of the crux of the matter. The crux of the matter is, is that I, based off of what actual lawyers are telling me, um, there's significant doubt as to whether or not you could convict him of espionage or treason or anything else. Um, if he did it while he was still in office because of the legal theory I, I, I expounded on earlier, which is essentially that um, presidents can't commit crimes and you can't try them for, the only way to try them for crimes is through the impeachment process. But um, certainly, during the, certainly during the Mueller investigation, I'd certainly heard attorneys um, talking as though it's important this is, um, this material is collected and maintained because it is uh, possible to uh, to convict presidents afterwards. So at least, well, we're going to find is, out. Isn't is it, is it, is it his possession of these documents a crime? Potentially, uh, it sh it should be. But the 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 argument is going to be made that the crime of removing them took place uh, while he was still still president. Okay, well, listen, while this has gone on, uh, I have a little feature on my computer where uh, stories, headlines from Raw Story and elsewhere pop in. And one of the headlines just said that Weisselberg, Alan Weisselberg, Trump's uh, CEO, um, or, or rather a chief accountant. Financial officer. A financial officer, his consigliere for finance has uh, uh, struck a deal to testify. So uh, I was seeing I was seeing contrary to that. I'll have to go back and check. My understanding was a Weisselberg got a five uh, cut a plea deal that didn't involve cooperation of five months. All right, well, let's find out. Let's find out. Okay. Uh, okay, uh, Danette, Danette Walker oh. and then Stephen. No, I'm next, I think. What's Lynn. that? Harvey, I'm next. Stephen Kaiser. 
Go ahead, Stephen. No. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, the one thing uh, you mentioned, why? Oh, I thought well, I was next. He's Sorry. the whole key. Lynn. Lynn. Me? So I'm. There's something in the chat here. Uh, Lynn is dead wrong. The stuff was removed from the White House before January 20th. Oh, it was. Okay. Yes. I, I just it mentioned that Weisselberg, if Weisselberg is turning over, he, he's the whole crux of how the money moved in, in Trump's whole organization. So that's going to be a, a really damning thing for him. Uh, the, the thing I wanted to uh, point out is your conjecture about him giving uh, secret documents to the Saudis or the Russians or whoever is just based on the fact that the these records were removed from the White House. You have no... It's all conjecture beyond that, that he actually gave this away to anybody that, that may be uh, compromised. Say that well, again? He says basically what basically the converse of what I asked, which is uh, it, if there's no evidence that he gave this stuff away or that he gave it only while he was president, is the possession of these documents itself a crime? Potentially. Okay, we're we're getting into some really weird areas here because he was president. <laughs> God, God help us. Okay, Danette, um, uh, Justin, and Dorothy. Oh, Bren. Um, so now I have new nightmare fuel. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> oh my God. Um, like, Me and have... Neil Gaiman. <laughs> oh dear God. Okay. Um. Yeah. So. Oh my. I don't even know where to start. Um. Okay, so if 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 A. G. Garland is working on this stuff, like I've heard, he's very buttoned up. He successfully tried Timothy McVeigh, among other people, but he takes his time. But I know it's driving everyone nuts. Do you foresee him coming through with any charges before the midterms in November? And if so, uh, do you think his best bet is to go after him for tax evasion or something? I know that's not going to prevent him from running again, but I think he wants to get charges that stick and actually punish him in some way. What is your take on that? So the charges that are most likely to stick of all the charges against him are the ones for potential perjury. Um, sometime June timeframe, the Department of Justice went back to him and said, and his, his lawyers and said, hey, did we get everything? Is there anything else that we need to know about? And Trump's lawyer said, no, 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 no. You got everything, you got everything, you got everything. You're, we're, we're good. And they're like, okay, will you sign an affidavit that you hold no more materials marked classified, right? And Trump's lawyers signed off on an affidavit reportedly that said that they'd handed over everything. Obviously, they hadn't handed over everything. Technically, file, filing a false affidavit is a form of perjury um, and lying to investigators. Um, so that's the one area where I look at Trump and go, yeah, he's in deep. That's the one that's going to be the hardest to beat, in my opinion, and talking to a few other people that are really familiar with matters. Uh, as far as when this comes down, the answer is, I don't know. It's going to be a little while while they sort everything out, while they figure out whether or not they could do this successfully. Uh, I mentioned them wanting to dot the I's and cross the T's. I think they're a little less afraid of him um, hightailing it for Cuba or someplace else without an extradition treaty. Um, so the answer is, I don't know. I think that that will be a consideration. But one of the other big considerations going on right here is that Garland and Dep Department of Homeland Security know that if Trump is indicted and if he is has to negotiate a surrender to authorities, um, boom, right? They're anticipating um, violence potentially worse than January 6th with a lot more guns. People forget that there are 20 million AR-15s in civilian hands in the United States. To put that in perspective, the two primary weapons that we armed servicemen with during World War II were the M1 Garand rifle and the M1 carbine. When you take the number of those that we manufactured and add them all together, we manufactured about 11.5 million. There's, there's about twice as many AR-15s floating around the US as there were guns manufactured for US troops in World War II. Okay, that, and by the way, AR-15s are way more accurate and lethal than either of those. 
Unbelievable. This is Bryn Tannehill. We're getting to close to the end. I really want to know, did they also take Trump's uh, collection of Hustler magazines or did they leave him uh, with that? Uh, <laughs> Justin LeBlanc and then Dorothy Reich. We still have 77 people on the call, which is more than we had an hour ago. Uh, Dorothy, uh, uh, Justin, Dorothy and Tatanka. So I want to bring up the uh, connection to the deleted texts from Secret Service, Pentagon, and yes. other Trump allies. Uh, so J.P. Morgan Chase was fined $200 million for just not keeping enough records on their text messages of bankers. And people can go to jail as trading desk people for all that. So I'm, I'm wondering where the prosecution stand on Trump allies around this and if any of that can be connected back to Trump himself as well. So I don't have any information on that, but remember um, at a number of places, including the, the, uh, the IG for the Secret Service and Department of Homeland Security were replaced by Trump and replaced with loyalists. Wow. Well, what, what happened to the texts and why, how did they get deleted and why can't they be retrieved? Uh, essentially the... My understanding is that they scheduled a software uh, and firmware update, which basically reset the operating systems on the phones, which overwrote everything. Um, I don't know if it's possible to retrieve any of that. Um, I, the, I, am, I have a degree in computer science, but it's from 1997, which predates cell phones significantly. Uh, so, I haven't heard anyone suggest that it's possible to get the emails back, but the way it was handled was clearly, um, and I think it's been cleared off of the cloud as well. Uh, so I don't know, I have not heard anyone suggest it's possible to get that back. Okay, um, uh, Dorothy Reich and Tatanka. Hi, so I just wanted to see if, um, have you listened to the Ian Masters um, interview with Bob Baer that he did yesterday? Absolutely fascinating. He echoes a lot of what you're saying, and he seems very sure that uh, that Trump has already sold information from the uh, stolen documents, and that's part of the reason that um, the Saudis gave two billion dollars to his son-in-law. Wow, that's such a deal. Of course, there's also speculation. Trump's niece speculated that it was um, a. a What's his name? Um, the son-in-law, what's his name? Kushner. Kushner. Kushner, I'm blanking on it for good reason. That it was Kushner who brought in the FBI to get the documents. For God knows why. But that, that's Mary Trump, Trump's niece, says that Kushner, Trump's son-in-law, was the bull who brought in the FBI. Now why, who knows, but there you go. Uh, thank you for that, Dorothy. Uh, to talk, it says, by the way, 34 minutes ago, NBC News said that Weiselberg is expected to plead guilty in the tax case, but it doesn't say what kind of deal he made to turn over. What I'm what I'm hearing is he is there is no there is no cooperation deal. Well, that would be a bummer. Um, okay, yep. Tatanka. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. I always thought in 2016, Trump was running for broke, running from the Russian mafia to avoid prison for failure to pay debts. And now 2024, the only place on earth where he's safe to commit treason, grand larceny, ecocide, whatever else a fascist dictator would do with the most powerful military in the world. Uh, it's the only place he's safe to do it is right in the White House. Anyway, we need do, we're not at the place yet, but I keep thinking about, we need to explore what we belong to. If it isn't a failed democratic republic that, of the United States that ensures some level of accountability and community, you know, human rights and what is beyond country. I'm thinking about John Denver. So can our political and legal system hold back armed insurrection from within from taking over a nation state and running the table full spectrum dominance of the planet in a fascist dictatorship. If it isn't Trump the person, that kind of ideology and that kind of thinking and lack of accountability that just feels safe, you know, the, the law is whatever the man, and it will be a man in this case, sitting in the White House says. 
I'm, what are you thinking about all this, Bryn, or do you even go there yet? So, okay, let me think about this. Okay. <laughs> so you're saying that Mar-a-Lago uh, is the only place that he could get away with these crimes? Well, I'm saying sitting and in the White House. Well, and Trump then, always and, felt I always thought that Trump felt like he was safest while he was in office. Yeah, um, that it afforded him a great degree of security. And I'd agree with that. He could get away with things he could never could have gotten away with before. Um, and it's, you know, this, uh, this is speculation, but, you know, it's the, the, the best description somebody has given to me of Trump is, is he's kind of a, he, he he's kind of a John Gotti. He's 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 a not as smart as he thinks he is. Mafia Don. Yeah, but his, uh, but his boss is Putin. Putin has been Trump's boss for since since he took office. Because Trump, I don't know that Trump, I would say boss, but I would say that Trump looks up to and admires Putin. Yeah, but um, Putin owns him. The Russian mob has owned a Trump since the 80s and Putin became the boss of the Russian mob. That's that's what Sarah Kenzior speculated in her book. Um, you know, and I'm going, I'm probably doing more speculation than I should um, right now. But looking ahead, one of the things that I really, really wanted to emphasize it um, is that the level of violence that is already being directed and intimidation and stochastic terror that's being inflicted on members of the, the, the court. Uh, keep in mind that the uh, judge who issued the warrant, um, they, their synagogue had to uh, not do uh, services this past weekend, right? Um, because there were so many death threats and bomb threats and threats of violence. Trump doxed the agents who served the warrant. Um, and now they are all in hiding because his followers have tracked them down and inundated them with death threats. Um, and the just this within the last 24 hours, um, Department of Homeland Security has issued warnings that they believe a lot of these threats are credible, right? There is the anticipation of imminent violence on behalf of the former president. Um, and this is and this is affecting their decision making. And beyond that, let's not forget that there is a lot, there are a lot of Trumpy sympathizers within traditionally conservative places like the FBI, the Secret Service, um, less so the intelligence community. Um, but overall, there are people out there that are willing to protect him within U.S. government agencies. Wow. It's really, really scary. Um, um, uh, we'll have to have you back next week if you can. Uh, because I'm reading here that the details of Weisselberg's deal have not been made public. And that, okay. that we, don't, we, don't know, we, don't we don't know what he has agreed to say and what he hasn't. Okay. But um, probably if the breaks that he has agreed to um, uh, uh, tell everything he knows about the Trump organization, the question then becomes who holds his life insurance policy uh, and when are they going to collect? Amaya um, Reason, uh, Steve and Dorothy, we're going to go over uh, 10 minutes. Steve, if you can stick with us, that would be great. This has all been recorded, by the way, uh, be because I think it's been worth it. Bryn, you're an excellent guest on this, and we appreciate your expertise. So, uh, Danit Abbott Wicker asked, is the military, military on the right side, though? The military is going to do what the Supreme Court says. If the Supreme Court says this is the law, the, the military will go that direction. Um, and that's. Well, well, I'm, uh, is the, do we have the same Joint Chiefs of Staff that we had under Trump? We do, but they are not particularly uh, friendly towards Trump. Uh, Trump hated Milley, and Milley thought that Trump was the worst threat to U.S. national security ever. 
So do, do we still have Millie on the, on the Joint Chiefs? General Millie is still chairman of the, of the uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff. Well, I never thought I'd be glad to, <laughs> to welcome a, a chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. I've seen, he was the one who mo mo walked with Trump when they evicted those kids from it, you know, they walked through the demonstrators and then Trump held the Bible upside down. He and did, Millie, and he and his, very sorry his, he was. Yeah. Yes. He right. he regarded it as the worst mistake he has ever made in his life. And he regretted immediately that he was being used for propaganda and he was disgusted with himself. Wow. Um, uh, Dorothy Reich, go ahead. And then Myla. Dorothy, Myla. I, I, Myla I think first. I'm I'm on. Unmuted now, Harvey. Yeah, Dorothy this is already Harvey. just spoke, so we'll go with Myla. Okay. Um, and anyway, Myla. Uh, thank you, Bryn, so much. And in addition to the, to the excellent analysis and perspective that you're uh, sharing with us, I suggest that people also listen to this extraordinary interview this morning on Democracy Now! with Karen Br Greenberg, uh, who happens to be the wife of your dear friend, uh, Danny. Danny Goldberg. Sluggo, yeah. And... Um, I, I'd also suggest that we invite her uh, possibly next week to, to provide some information because she's really quite the uh, expert in this field. I and, will ask her. Thank you for that. And, oh. and, and I, I also agree with Dorothy. Um, the interview uh, that Ian Masters conducted with Bob Bear is also quite useful. So thanks to all of the experts for providing us with so much important information. Well, what an amazing discussion. Um, Steve Caruso, and then uh, Danette again. Dorothy, were you satisfied? Did you want to say anything? No, you're good? OK. Uh, Steve Caruso, then Danette. I, and I guess we'll have to go if anybody still have 69 people. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, uh, so uh, Danette, and then um, anybody else wants to uh, jump in, uh, please do. Steve, Danette. Yeah, for. Um the Justice Department to do anything but administer justice. I mean, the whole thing is the scales, blind justice with the blindfold. If these guys want to come out and cause trouble, it's a honeypot. Let them come out, let people, let the law take care of them. We're a country that runs by the rule of law, and that's the way it should be. And uh, Millie came out in, in support of some good things later on. It's a shame he got involved with Lafayette Park, but thanks. Thank you. Okay, Jeanette, um, uh, Justin, and then we'll end it with Mike Hirsch. Uh, Mike will get the last word, and we'll we'll sign off. I know, Bryn, you got to go eat dinner. Um, Sorry, uh, Bryn. So <laughs> um, Bryn, and, thank you so much for being here. Will you come back and give us updates regularly to terrify us? Uh, if I'm asked, yeah, <laughs> that okay. would be amazing. And then also, um, uh. And I totally forgot what I was going to ask you. Um, <laughs> anyway, I don't know. I'm just like terrified right now. Okay. I was going to ask you a great question and now it just slipped yeah, out. Brenda, what is the title of your book? Title of my book is American Fascism, How the GOP is Subverting Democracy. I penned the last words of it uh, in January uh, 2020 before we went and got the galley proofs. It came out in April 20, 2021, and it's still absolutely as relevant as it was when it went to press. Right. And my own people's history, people's spiral of U.S. history, I'm waiting until the 22 elections, and then I'll finish up. I hope we still have a, a democracy. Uh, my, my slogan will be, buy it before they burn it. Um, um, Bryn, you've been great. Justin, Thank real you. quick, and Mike, you can take us out. Justin LeBlanc, go ahead, and then Mike. All right, so uh, uh, Trump has gotten free media attention for the past 40 years. And so Millie is an interesting character because he talks about scanning all kinds of threats and media attention can be one of those. So I'm wondering uh, what we're doing about holding the media accountable for Trump's propaganda over these years, as well as actually studying uh, how dark money is in, uh, infiltrating media to stop democratic outcomes, even voter suppression. That's, you know, we talk about emergency election protection, we should focus on that. That's a good one. And uh, um, we'll deal with that uh, in coming weeks. Uh, Bryn, you want to comment on that? We'll go to Mike Hirsch, and then we'll let you go eat dinner. So Trump got like $2 billion with a free media coverage. 
Um, and I do, and my book actually talks about him being a bit of a PT Barnum. He believes that all publicity is good publicity. He's using this to rally, he's using this to rally the base to him. He's using this to, they love the narrative of white guys being the victim. We're seeing that, I'm seeing that pop up a lot. Uh, both here and in the UK is, oh my God, white white men have it so bad that they're resorting to porno and video games, right? Oh, I saw that. And I'm like, I yeah, it. yeah. You know, I, I hate to tell you, but um, guys will play video games and look at porno whether or not they're <laughs> discriminated against. Right. It's just kind of right, a right, right, right. natural right. state of being, really. Yeah. For And I think um, it was that, that woman from Cal uh, Colorado, Bobert, who made that yeah order. i think it was bobert or marjorie taylor green yeah they're, so, they're, they're kind of interchangeable listen brent thank you so much go have a good dinner mike hirsch uh, do you want to sign off for us and uh, give uh, give the last word to brent there are a couple things real quick thank you again brent for uh being with us you're welcome anytime your insights are very valuable and i just want to uh underscore you heard news that isn't on the news yet so you're going to be able to impress all your friends with your inside information, thanks to the great questions that Sluggo keeps asking, the great guests we keep having on. And I'm going to give one last plug I put in the chat. We need your donations. We have a direct link right in there. We want to keep going. We know you appreciate this content. So uh, pitch in whatever you can afford, and we'll keep having Bryn back. We'll keep having great guests uh, like we keep hearing week after week after week. And we have these great shows with Sluggo Wasserman, a legend, um, a, a history maker and a historian. So he gets to cover himself. But um, we have wonderful people on all the time. And I just want to call on everybody to, uh, to just show your appreciation. And if um, I know Dorothy was having some trouble getting unmuted, I, I, I want to see if there was uh, one last word that Dorothy might want to give. Dorothy, are you out there? I, I just want to say that uh, the New York Times is reporting that Weisselberg has, has made a deal and he is not going to be cooperating. Um, he's going to get a five-month sentence. That's a, so that's my sources exactly were correct. What, yeah, that's exactly what Bryn was saying. So she scooped the New York Times. All right. Okay. I got my sources. Yeah, there you go. Uh, so so we're, we're hearing... Thing. We're we're getting the news before the New York Times right here well, on this news. Had it twenty minutes ago. It just said I can unmute. Well, but, uh, we're, we're we're working on those technical difficulties, okay. Dorothy. Thank you for standing by. Thank All you, right. everybody. Everybody have a great great day. Take care. We'll see everybody next week. Thank you, Mike Hurst, Steve Caruso, um, and, and the rest of the crew, Wendy Wiederman, and we'll be back next week, hopefully. <laughs> Thank you for the more. nightmares. <laughs> Take care, everybody. No nukes. And thank you, uh, my um, Tatanka, for your donation. We certainly appreciate it.